minutes from October 6th as circulated? We do not. Second by Randall, moved by Reddy. Any opposition to carrying this um, by common consent? Hearing none, the motion is carried. <clears throat> Item number six is a discussion and presentation regarding the state of the Southern University Law Center. Everyone, as you all know, we have, we have a, a great challenge before us. Uh, at the last meeting, we talked about the opportunity of being able to explore um, all of the necessary criteria that would aid this committee in this selection process of being able to determine the best candidate for the job. One of the tasks that we assigned to uh, Professor Diamond was to look at the criteria uh, for accreditation to make sure that this group really understood and had a great handle on the accreditation process and what a candidate really needed to possess. In addition to that, we tasked her with the opportunity of being able to give us uh, a state of the Southern University Law Center, what's really there, what it looks like as far as staffing, faculty, uh, all that is involved with respect to numbers of students at the university. And so she's taken some time, and in your materials, you should have a copy of what we term to be the state of the Southern University Law Center. And at this time, I will turn over uh, for the discussion and presentation by Professor Diamond. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Can you hear me? Um, the, the document that Mr. Murray is talking about is this one. I prepared it for your review to introduce you to uh, the institution that you already know and love, but to tell you all about it, maybe from a different perspective, to let you know uh, how intricate the workings of the law center happen to be. Uh, and I contextualize my presentation to you within uh, leading with the, the mission statement of the Law Center. Uh, this is a mission statement that was uh, drafted by the faculty uh, in, with the leadership of uh, the last Chancellor, Chancellor Pitcher. Uh, it was drafted by the faculty, uh, approved by the board, and it says that we're here for a basic reason to provide access and opportunity to a diverse group of students from underrepresented racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic groups to obtain a high quality legal education with a skills necessary for the practice of law. So uh, with that in mind, when we're looking for this new chancellor, all of our work should be focused on that with the understanding that you're picking someone to lead the uh, law center into its next phase, uh, and that that person needs to be able to rise to the challenge of leadership uh, towards the accomplishment of the best interests of the students. To tell you a little bit about the law center and how it's structured, I've laid out for you here, uh, so that you can see that we are, we are organized uh, under a system of administrative support units as well as two academic support units. I don't know how many of you understood that probably every uh, office you walk in has a specific function and a specific detail that it operates under to make the law center run well. Uh, we hope it's like a well or oil machine, but as, as we all are, it's still a work in progress. Uh, we have uh, 12 administrative support units and two academic support units, and again, they all share the same goal. Everyone is there in the law center day in and day out trying to ensure that law center students have every opportunity to successfully matriculate through the law center and to move to that one grade exam after the end of three years to successfully pass a bar exam. So I thought it was important for you to know what those bar exam results look like over the last six settings. That's on page two. And the number that we struggle with battling is the one that's in the first bar uh, there. I've given you bar, bar exam, Louisiana bar exam statistics, because those are the ones that we have, that's, those are the statistics that we have the, the most data on. Uh, our overall passage rate has uh, moved between 55.2% uh, in July uh, 2010, 
up to a high of 62.2% in 11, and you see what the other results are. And so when those numbers are low, what that means is uh, that students have lost opportunity costs. And so in picking the next chancellor, we want to pick the person who's best suited to make those opportunity costs for students not exist to this to this level. Someone who has vision, someone who has specific plans on how to help students have better success on because they all come to law school wanting to be lawyers. Now there are some outliers who want to use that degree to, to do something else. And we, we recognize that, but whatever it is that they come uh, expecting to do, we would like to push them towards uh, that success. And most of them actually do want to become lawyers, but they can't unless they pass a bar exam. So that chancellor will, we're looking for someone who possesses that leadership in that area. Uh, so I outlined what I thought were the three areas of focus for that new chancellor. And so I, I outlined three areas of stabilization and strengthening. And I guess as I conceptualize strengthening, I also uh, just implicit in strengthening would be growth for me. And so those are the three areas that I, I have there. The, uh, one point is the faculty point. The other point is the law center administration point. And the other point is the uh, law center staff, staffing point. Understanding that all of those pieces are necessary to work together in harmony and towards that same end to make the most of opportunities for students. So uh, I'm suggesting that I would like to give you some information about the law center faculty because the, those are the individuals part-time and full-time who are on the ground making it uh, happen in the classroom day in and day out for uh, students. And I'm suggesting to you that the person we select has got to work hard uh, towards that uh, stabilization and strengthening of the law faculty. We have uh, Professor Riddick here, one of our recent uh, matriculants, has left the building. Uh, we've had, how many did we have last year? Five retirees or seven? Seven, seven retirees in one year. I would like to tell you that that is a great destabilization effect in the law faculty because it's not just those four, those uh, seven individuals. That accounts for 28 courses across a year. So uh, you can understand 28 courses across in one year because he left us and along with six others, that has a great impact. Uh, that person who comes in to do that job has got to have understand that 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 can be problematic and destabilizing, but it's a tremendous opportunity. There has to has there has to be someone who steps into the job who understands the opportunity and how to seize upon the opportunity in the planning mode to help lead the faculty in understanding. Well, what do, when we can hire a game? How are we going to plan to? To, to fill those spots. What is it? Because it's an opportunity for growth and change. How do we see ourselves moving forward with uh, filling those faculty positions? And I would suggest to you that you look at the staff, and I will not read those to you, about the balance between full-time faculty and part-time faculty. We've largely uh, made some uh, part-time uh, replacements for those slots, but that is not sustainable. Uh, there has to be some, at the time when we can rehire, there has to be some decision about, well, how that can happen and how it should happen. And the chancellor in uh, conjunction with the, with the faculty will be making some of those decisions. On the next page, I suggest to you that at the highest administrative level of the, uh, of the, the law center, that there are some challenges for the chancellor uh, and the three vice chancellors. We currently have three vice chancellors uh, at the law school. Uh, and each office works at, in a very specialized way of uh, making sure the law center can run day in and day out 
uh, towards the effort of making sure student learning. Yes, sir. Yes. Oh. <laughs> ah, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, the chancellor piece, the largest chancellor piece there, is a piece of shared governance as it affects balancing the mission and vision uh, that he or she would have uh, in conjunction with faculty collaboration in those targeted areas there and towards the end of repairing the critical deficit in full-time law center faculties. And I have described for you the challenges for the, for the vice chancellors who would serve uh, under the leadership of the, the new chancellor. Next page, and uh, just to, to honor and recognize that from the highest office in the law center to those who serve at the, the, uh, the even the level of staff who are um, janitors uh, and serve in that capacity. That is very important for a chancellor who's leading the institution to know the value and the place and honor that for each 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 and every employee in the law center. And so that uh, a chancellor was selecting someone who understands that, who has a, a sense of, of the place of leadership that he or she would have in dealing with every worker at every level in the law center. And I closed my <clears throat> report to you and I was asked, I last, last meeting I gave you a stack of uh, standards from ADA, ALS, and SACS, COC, and I was asked, can you summarize that? And I, I said, well, they're standards. I think they're there, but I honored that request and I did summarize those to understand. <laughs> we have two accrediting bodies and one uh, membership uh, in a very uh, sought-after membership uh, with ALS. The Association of American Law Schools is a, a membership that we worked very hard on getting and we were, uh, we are in our, uh, I think our sixth or seventh year of membership in ALS. Uh, and so ALS has some of the most stringent standards for, uh, stringent standards, standards for law schools to follow and they are very 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 so very much so interested in understanding how the a chancellor or a dean because most law schools have deans how a, a dean and a, and a law school uh, faculty can work together collaboratively and so that concept of shared governance is very strong with ALS membership also strong with ADA, and so I introduce you to those standards that are, ALS is not accreditation, but it is a membership that we have that we don't want to lose. SACS, COC, and ADA are accredita accrediting bodies. Uh, so with both ADA and AALS, they both are very much so focused on faculty participation, and so that's one of our amended um, agenda items. They are very much so uh, vested in seeing that the law schools have a collect that the law schools have a significant faculty participation in the selection of a chancellor or a dean, specifically ADA standard 202 that a dean or a chancellor, and I highlighted it for you because I think that's it's very important for you to know, should not be appointed or reappointed over the stated objection of a substantial majority of the faculty. And uh, AALS bylaw 6-5, we turn to your last page. Uh, there's a general rule that no decanal or faculty appointment be made over the expressed opposition of the faculty. Now, that opposition of the faculty can be uh, divine through the faculty acting as a whole or by a representative portion determined by reasonable criteria, but that those are very important standards for us to make sure that we, in our process, that we have cut out an opportunity. When it says over the objection, then very obviously there has to be some way of finding out what that faculty viewpoint is 
and that faculty input, I would imagine, would have to happen through some um, faculty vote or some faculty expression of their opinion. The exact process can be worked out as we continue to talk, but that there is uh, a very important value with all the accrediting and membership bodies that uh, a chance that we that we come to understand and recognize in our process that uh, an important value in all of these bodies is one of shared governance, and that we select a chancellor who, or, or we have a chancellor that we select a chancellor that understands that value of shared governance and has that we be able to query that that candidate to see what his or her viewpoint on the issue of shared governance is. And so, if you have questions for me, I'll be happy to answer them. First, let me say thank you on behalf of the full committee. I know Mr. President Belton. Uh, I for your time and effort that you put into summarizing what we're referring to as the State of the Southern University Law Center and the need to make sure that we, as a collective body, understand um, the elements of what Deanery is all about, the elements of what Deanery is all about in accreditation. So we appreciate that very much and we greet your report with favor. We will, as Cheryl, will make sure that this is attached to the minutes as a supplement to the minutes for today's meeting. At this time, any questions um, regarding the report? Yes, Singleton and then I don't have any questions, but as respect to the, uh, the students, uh, I didn't see much maybe pass by the students' input on, on the chapter. And I think that's more, it's very specific about the students, you know, the students' perspective on, on the direction of the chapter. Absolutely. I think that's very important. You're absolutely right. Uh, do you want to speak to that? Oh, you can address it. I mean, please, and I'll chime in. Yes. And so, in our preliminary discussions, we, we talked about segmenting and setting aside an opportunity for faculty to vet the candidates at some point in time. We'll have a discussion about that in a few minutes. And also, that it's important concomitantly for students to have a time to set aside to, to vet the candidate or the once we decide where we're going to do that, you're absolutely right. And so it was my suggestion, should I say it? My suggestion is that the, instead of having a, a town hall sort of meeting, that, that will be the committee's, uh, that will be the committee's choice. It would be my suggestion that we carve out that time for the various heads of the student organizations to express the will of the student body and that that will probably happen, did we say the 23rd? Yeah, and we will drill down into that. Uh, but you're absolutely right, and thank you for bringing that up. Great observation. That's what's that? I think you answered my question, but I, I, I guess I'm going to now add that one. The, um, I guess the students' um, reference or students' opinion, as well as the faculty's, mm -hmm. is that um, expressed with all of the candidates or after the candidates are narrowed down? We believe that the approach will be after we have narrowed it down to the whatever number we believe, we report it to the board on January 8th between uh, four to six candidates, uh, depending upon you know, the, the will of this body. Once we narrow it down, that would be the group that we would give access to the faculty as well as to the student body. <laughs> Yes, but, uh, we could just go down the list unless you want to okay. yield. Okay. Yes. I'll just start coming from a student uh, perspective. Uh, last, the beginning of the fall semester, we actually did a school wide survey. It was a generic survey about what the students were looking for in a um, chancellor. And it, there's no specific name, it's not in reference to any one person. Uh, so I can share those uh, survey results. I can email them to you and express those. And then we probably do the heads of student works. Not a kind of I think a survey might kind of set some light as well from a student perspective. And, and your input as you know, president of the body at the Law Center would be very valuable to how we take the next steps in making these uh, semifinalists we're going to call to available to the student body. So yes. And I'll say that right now that's a big big topic on campus with all students from one L to E mean to three L's. Everyone is talking about it. So I think a town hall would be successful. I think you would have a lot of attendance at all the candidates that we 
but in the top tier or whatever, people would definitely show up. I, I can tell you traditionally that's the feel I'm getting. Okay. Ms. Gannon? Um, um, I heard you mention the faculty and the um, students, but I want to make sure as persons sitting here representing the staff that we also have uh, some kind of, or, you know, opinions on uh, that too. You know, so uh, we want to, excuse me, I want to be able to um, be sure that they have some sort of input. Um, Is this Professor Diamond that indicated, you know, the chance of the law center needs to have a, a good understanding of the needs of the university that includes that. Yes. And also Professor, um, President Delton has indicated early on, I think in his charge, that uh, having members of the faculty as well as members of the staff, members of the local community involved <laughs> in this entire process, that I even find you here, that that will be an important element My for this session. Let's see, and Mr. Rutledge, yes. And, yes. Uh, the, the standards, these two last points, Professor Diamond, um, <coughs> faculty individually or, or collectively being consulted, and the no appointment can be made over the express opposition of the faculty. These are ABA or ALS? Um, the last two, if we go back to the first sheet, prior sheet, that's the ALS file. Okay. Um, if we go to, in the top of the same sheet, ABA standard 202, that's the ABA standard. Okay. So they are somewhat similar. Okay. One more strongly stated than the other. Now, in looking at the uh, agenda, for the semi-finalist interviews, I see where there is going to be some uh, interaction with both the faculty and the students. It's not your suggestion that the faculty is then going to be given an opportunity to vote independent of this committee as to the acceptability of whoever uh, ultimately emerges through this process. Is that is that the suggestion? Well, my question is that how would the faculty say its objection if they've not had an opportunity to vet? Well, I'm or how could the faculty make any any viewpoint now if it were not allowed to vet and and see? It would only the faculty would have the opportunity. Maybe you would say to see the same paper that that we have distributed to us and make it a, make its wishes or its preferences or its ideas based on the paper but i would suggest to you that sometimes paper can be deceptive yeah. and so that the wisest choices are always made after you meet somebody face to face and let me just say i'm i'm not, I'm not suggesting at all that the faculty should not uh, uh, influence who is ultimately selected to be the chancellor of law school. I think that's very important, not only for the faculty, but every constituent member of the law center, be they faculty, students, staff, alumni. Uh, <clears throat> but I, I'm just, my wheels are turning to see how the chair and the leadership of the group will be able to, to manage this. Uh, because it's it's my sense that the faculty is well represented on this committee, uh, and perhaps whatever thoughts, ideas, and suggestions the faculty has about who ought to emerge in this process among the universal candidates, perhaps can best be conveyed to its representatives that are present on the committee. And I think at the end of the day, that's where we need to lean to look to the staff that is on this committee as well as the faculty that is on the committee uh, for their input. What I think that we're trying to portray here is an opportunity for the semi-followers to spend some time on campus with the faculty, have, for example, free ring binders available at certain times, not being able to walk away with information, but to have, for example, Professor Diamond is saying, on Monday, Wednesday, Friday of a certain week, the applicants' applications are available so that they will know who's coming, where they're from, know a little bit about the candidate, 
Then those person would arrive on campus to spend some quality time with the faculty and students and staff is what we're trying to possibly have available. At that point, then faculty can get together and talk collectively about the pool of semifinalists to see, we really like this group. Are we, you know, think two or three people in this group, but that will be shared in confidence with faculty. That could be shared in confidence from staff with staff, with the student representative that we have on the committee. At that time, when we come to uh, our next meeting, uh, we would have an opportunity before the interviews, because all of that we're thinking would happen on the morning of. If you flip to the last page that Kara has made available for us, you know, this is not etched in stone. This is just a brainstorming to try to do some of the work of the committee before we got here today. If you would go to TBA draft schedule of semifinalist interview itinerary, so you see that document toward the end of your packet that Cheryl provided you with? Does everyone have it? If you would look at this, is just. Oh, okay. Yeah, just keep going in back. Uh, it says TBA draft schedule. Sorry, thank you, Chef. TBA draft schedule. Thank you. Let me make sure that's really important. It's in front of the app. That was one applicant packet supplied to you. It's right in front of the applicant packet. Yes, Okay. Just as a guide, this was the, this is just brainstorming prior to the meeting to try to help us get through the meeting a little bit smoother. The timeline right now suggests that February 23rd would be the date that the candidates would actually be invited as semifinalists to Baton Rouge. Arrivals would be the day before. Have a breakfast possibly at the law center that morning meeting with the faculty between 8.30 and 10.30 for them to be able to meet the candidates personally prior to their interviews. Prior to that, they will have had access to the applications, letters of recommendation, everything that the candidates submitted for consideration. Following that, they would have a possible meeting with the student body and staff would have been an opportunity for them to be able to talk prior to being interviewed. Break for lunch. At that time, the semifinalists then would be have their scheduled interviews. We would anticipate spending not less, maybe more, but not less than an hour with each candidate, uh, giving them an opportunity to present themselves through introductory remarks, to talk about themselves, to really sell themselves to the committee, and then we would use not less than you know 40 minutes or so for detailed interviews with certain pre-selected questions that we believe are pertinent to the process. And after interviews, we would collectively come together, make a final recommendation of ranking each one of these candidates so that we can submit the top three names after having taken into consideration whatever comments we get from the faculty, comments we get from the staff, comments we get from the student body, and the collective thoughts of this committee, we would then be in a position to adequately be able to rank for the top three candidates for submission to the president. So that's kind of what we were thinking about. Yes, that's nice. And let me say that it is, these are accredited. <coughs> Uh, concerns uh, when ABA says not over 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 an objection to of a substantial and the rest goes on that is an accreditation issue it's, so it, it does make law school searches different from other searches in that respect is that because ABA and both ALS have made it such and so we're really not at, at liberty to not honor that in some real way now how that looks is up to this body to decide but when 
for example, ALS says that must be consulted with respect to appointment of the dean before submission of any official recommendation to the final appointing authority. That, that, that has real teeth in it. And it means before it goes to the board that the faculty individually or collectively, and I do, I do not feel, I don't know about uh, Professor Riddick, I don't feel that I am representative. I don't think the three of us are representative of the faculties all yes I mean yes we could hold them and see if but I, I don't at this point <laughs> I feel like that, that I am able to give that representative voice to the faculty. And secondly that it the suggestion that there be this opportunity is not at all an unusual thing. Chancellor and Dean searches across the nation very this is what happens. Uh, and that just makes law schools different. I was trying to remain quiet, which is not a professorial thing to do, is it? <laughs> um, Mr. Rutledge feels like the faculty is adequately represented here, President Belton, but let me tell you, the last committee to search for a chancellor, 12 years ago, I was on that committee also. That committee was dominated by faculty members chosen by the faculty. There are two professors that were tenured as professors that one is now an administrator and still a professor. The other is not a professor emeritus. He's not a professor at all. He's just an old retiree that y'all put out to pasture. So we are underrepresented in some ways on this committee especially when we compare it with a committee that met last time. With all due respect to the process that occurred last time, Mr. Rutledge, the faculty had very definite feelings, President Belton, as to who they thought the leadership would be. And like this time, there were some very, very qualified, diverse background applicants for the position. Professor Diamond, Watch the process as I did, and I'm looking around the table. Several of the administrative staff was here and watched the process. But that faculty input resulted in three recommendations, Mr. Murray, to the Board of Supervisors. The Board of Supervisors, in its infinite wisdom, took none of those three recommendations. I too served on that group. I remember. <laughs> and you remember what happened to our recommendation. And the board then came back and appointed someone that had not been vetted by the faculty, the staff, the alumni, or so forth. Now, he had a very successful tenure, but he also had a rocky one sometimes. We'll tell you. May sound time consuming. The ABA rules may seem to be arcane and crazy, but they're built on years of experience about the uniqueness law schools and legal education and law professors are notoriously independent and so are even the adjunct professors that teach part time but the reason the law school is at a more critical stage in my opinion is the seven senior faculty members that retired were replaced if you look at the statistics teaching required courses that are going to be on the bar by part-time adjunct professors as Mr. Murray knows, since he's an adjunct, we have some outstanding adjunct professors. I was an adjunct professor myself for about 20 years before essentially I retired from the world of politics by popular demand of the voters and assumed my previous academic career, Mr. Belton, because I've been a professor at LSU, Rutgers, and others. And I went back to doing something I loved is do adjunct professors. And most of our adjuncts are so pitifully paid they don't serve for the money, I promise you. They serve for the love of education, the love of the law school, or some other motivation. But we need the input of the adjuncts too, because they carry the burden how? They carry the burden when full-time faculty members retire, and when you have a budget crunch like we have, the retirement wasn't motivated by old age. I've probably still been over there teaching. It was motivated by what? The necessity of balancing a budget that had been increasingly penalized, not because of anybody in the law school, and we were doing the best we could, but if we didn't make room in the budget, 
there would have been all kind of staff layoffs, other young untenured professors who had a lot of promise laid off, et cetera. So I don't seem to feel strongly about the omission here, but I do not think I speak for the faculty because I'm retired. Though she's a very able faculty member and has been for many years, she's now perceived of as what? A vice chancellor, for better or for worse, as they say. And I had this conversation with her before the meeting. And are each of you viewed in a role that you play as either alumni, staff, et cetera? So somebody needs to engage the faculty because they're going to make or break the law school and the new chancellor. Whoever he or she, well, we don't have a she after them, do we? Oh, we have one she after them. He or she may be. So I hate to, I hate to sound like I have been down this track before. Mr. Murray's been down it with me, and Professor Diamond was one of the participants in the process, and several of the other folks on the administrative staff were here when we went through it, and on the adjunct and clinical staff. My urging to you is put as much time for a semifinalist at least to be able to interact as much as possible with both faculty, alumni, students, and staff in particular, because all of those elements have got to be in support of the selection where that person starts off with a handicap. And, and I, I, I know whoever structured this committee did its best job that they could, and I know that there are some outstanding people on the committee, but there's no active, non-administrative faculty member full-time in the tenure track area that's represented. Thank you. That's a question. How does one uh, coordinate a, a, a message to do that, uh, to make that happen? How does that be done? We got uh, a, 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 a list of faculty members. So just how would that, you don't want to take it for six months time to talk to you. Let's Professor Diamond speak to it. There are techniques that we've used in the past and techniques similar to what Mr. Harrington was talking about about surveys and other things. Go ahead. Oh, you just waited. I think what we find ourselves here is you know, February uh, night when we come back. We will have an opportunity to take all the applications, narrow those applications down based upon what we think we see on paper. If you like that item eight, we're talking about due diligence. We expect that several, several of you will have an applicant to go and do your due diligence. In other words, if someone said they wrote a law, a law review article, we need to know that that is true. If someone said they're licensed to practice law in Texas, we need to make sure that somebody on this committee has confirmed that. If you said you have served in various capacities and you have experience with budgets and you understand them and you've you know, met with a legislature, someone will have to do that. So we're going to have some assignments when we leave here. And so that's the part about due diligence. Um, with our timeline, what we're looking at here is, question is that it relates to staffing, uh, and this may not be an appropriate time to discuss it, maybe some other time, but I, this is still on my mind. I want to finish what my thoughts are. And my thoughts on this is uh, if there are faculty members who may choose to participate in some type of ordinate way to uh, be able to speak with the, the, uh, the individual who are going to be teaching uh, these students, I think that's, that is the most important thing that we got going on is these teachers, these students, and the, the, and the faculty member who's going to be uh, uh, watching over these three years and making sure you work and make sure it happens well. You know? So I'm concerned about that of how we will approach that, Mr. Chair, and on any other person who may have some thoughts about it that may be down the road, but I would like for it to be in somebody's mind that we need to do something that we can uh, at least get the voice of the faculty. And that's what I was trying to articulate here is that we will make available to the faculty the systemic violence applications. Once we have narrowed that down, they will have an opportunity at the law center to go through those. Then we would also invite the systemic violence on campus, i.e. this is just a little graph, for them to spend at least two hours 
one on one with the faculty that choose to come to that faculty meeting. And that way questions can be raised and have an opportunity to do one on one with those individuals. And then there will be an opportunity for staff and student body to have that same type of meeting with the semifinalists. And at that point, they can report to Patrick. Patrick can then come to this group and we can understand that group. Was that group received well as semifinalists? I think that's overstated objection. Same way with the faculty. The faculty would have an opportunity to have a representative to come and speak on behalf. In other words, i.e. a committee member, i.e. trusted with you as the faculty, would, would come and say, what has the observations been made by the faculty? What are their concerns? Do they greet with favor or not? This pool of semi-finals. And we would hear from each one of them. That would give us an opportunity for their input the need for attaching this report that has been prepared and for us having this deliberation today and taking these steps to make sure that if someone comes back and look at this process, we follow the ABA requirements. I think we will embed it at that point. But I think with that limited amount of, of a process of how we get there through making the applications available, making the, the applicants available for one-on-one -on -one conversations with the faculty, staff, and students, and then a report to this body so we can determine is there a stated objection that rises to the level of this accreditation process. We will be in a, a good position to be able to then complete our interviews, rank these candidates to see based upon the reports that we receive from everyone, do we have three qualified candidates that will show us the competence and experience to be able to be submitted to the president. Ms. Whenever I was kind of doing some my own research on just chancellor searches in general, uh, I noticed that, for example, the UL system, they've done about three past few years. And I noticed one where they had faculty who uh, voted no confidence. So I guess my question is, does our faculty have like a senate where they vote on different things or just a group of faculty yeah. that they meet? If that's what I would love for us to stay away from. Yeah. I, oh, want, yeah, I know. We want the comments. Be yeah, I would love to have comments because I don't think they have the right to vote as we do. We're charged with a different type of vote. I think it is a nod of confidence, you know, or it will, I'm sorry. the right words. I mean, I've always got, because um, you know, I talk out of class like that. Are they acceptable? Acceptable. You know, to the faculty. Does the faculty feel that they're within this pool, there's a candidate or several candidates that the collegial background that they believe that they should have among themselves as faculty, we find in this candidate. And I, I think that's what the ABA suggested to us. Uh, let's see. Any, I, I thought I saw a hand over here. If not, that's ready. Mm -hmm. uh, following up on the conversation, when I look at your schedule, you have a meeting with faculty. Will anyone be present other than faculty? I plan to be there. Okay. How about meeting with students? I plan to be there. So what about the rest of the committee? More than welcome. It will be open to all of us. The interview schedule has a specific time. But my thoughts on the, you know, I yeah. said I would love to be there. I think it would not be the type of opportunity for the faculty if all of us are there. We, we're going to have our opportunity. Well, and that, that's where I was going. I think you need to structure this a little bit better so that students feel like they've got some exclusive time with the candidates, so does the faculty, probably so does the staff. Because, I think that, you know. And then, and then this, I assume the, the last interview schedule will be in this room. Yes. And anybody who wants to come, will they be able to ask questions or will they just be able to sit and listen to the questions? I think at that point we could be able to listen. That's just my top of my head. I think after we've exposed them to the faculty, exposed them to the student body and the staff, they will have that one-on-one. -on -one. We will have a report based on the, whether they agree with favor or whether they not agree with favor. And when they come in here for their personal interviews, you know, it will be interviews by this committee. Will they fill out an evaluation based upon their interviews similar to the ones you have for the committee? We have an evaluation a instrument in here. No. For the faculty students, no, we're looking for a report of some type of. What kind of report is what I'm asking? An oral report. That's what I would like to receive. I would anticipate that the faculty 
will respond to the presentations of the candidates by speaking or, or saying that candidates, that the pool of candidates that are acceptable are these, and the pool of candidates that are not acceptable are these. And then that would place it square based on what the accreditation rules are for us, for our consideration. How do we want to treat them? Yeah. Do we receive it favorably? Do we not receive it? Do we see something totally different? And I thank Professor and everyone else here that I would want to be there because I, I do not believe that Falcon will get out of hand, but I think I would need to be there as the chair of this committee just to make sure that if there are inappropriate questions, inappropriate statements, I would like to be able to chime in. If there are inappropriate statements from the student body, somebody in authority needs to be there to make sure if there's an opportunity, things can happen. And I think we owe that to the candidates or some representatives. Yes, and I would, it's my impression, and I, it's just my reaction to that, Mr. Lurie, is that your presence would have a chilling effect on the faculty. Well, I don't expect it with the faculty. But I, I can also assure you that the faculty conducts itself very respectively. Yes. I, I, did, I would not, I'm, I can't imagine that they would be out of out of place. It's not my experience. Now, they are lawyers, and they, they have very strong opinions. Right. But it, it will turn out, it generally those things turn out to be very political. The faculty is very uh, schooled and versed at uh, conducting interviews to hire faculty. It's not, it won't be anything that will be unusual to them. They won't be trying out their, their, their land legs. It's something that they're accustomed to do and they're to do out. So I, I don't think you have to worry about that here, and I will be there to make sure. Patrick is here as a student body. I would anticipate that Patrick would take the leadership on that. that. Professor Diamond would take the leadership with the faculty in this game, would take yeah. the leadership with the staff. And I think we can, we can get this accomplished. Yeah. So are we good on this, guys? I mean, this is all just brainstorming, and as we over the next several days, we can take this and you know talk about it more. We can as well develop this process, but this was just an idea of how we can get to meet the accreditation requirements as well as get everyone after lunch in here for a series of interviews by this committee. Yes. So, just before the student meeting, was with the question be pre-selected? How? No, no, that's just that's up to you all. Okay. Everyone, no, so yes. I'll did administrative staff and alumni? We want to make it available to whoever wants to. I know the, the requirements basically is for the faculty by the Yeah, that's what they're pressing for. But we want the student body's participation. Clearly, we want the staff uh, input as well. Yes. Well, and, and I think what you're going to structure it, even if you just leave, like for example, you have a breakfast, even if you just have administrative staff and alumni at the breakfast or at the reception at night, at least they have a role and have an opportunity if they want to speak to the candidates. So I don't think we need to leave any of our constituent groups out in in interacting with the finalists is what I guess I'm trying to say. Okay. What are we structuring? Yes. How did you decide that you students? No, we, uh, it would be led by our committee member, Patrick, uh, as a SBA president. But I want to know how are the students going to be selected? Uh, one, one person decide what students are going to be like. I just was going to be like an open forum, basically, and just mm -hmm. kind of yeah. submit questions via uh, note card and things go from there. That's not that's so a process that, that where we know what the questions are, and you know, someone just raise right. their hand a little bit. Because that will happen. Yes, I know about this. this is, when were the oral reports from the faculty and students be presented to us? Yeah, again, I mean, this was just a timeline. We're going to have a receiver report prior to the other day. Individuals are at the end to receive it. Yeah. But either way it goes, it would be on the 20, uh, set, uh, 23rd, January 23rd, we would receive a report uh, from everybody. Yes. Yes. 
covered a large portion of item eight. We got Yes. The next point on item eight, guys, we are we talk a little bit about due diligence and uh, think about if there is a particular applicant you'd like to complete the due diligence on. Uh, we're going to come back to that in, in a second. But relevant questions uh, for the interview that will be conducted by uh, the committee itself. We can give that some serious thought about what questions we feel a candidate should address that will speak to the experience and qualifications of that candidate and how this candidate can present uh, herself publicly. Um, and the, the thinking here is, is that uh, the committee works toward developing some questions and if we direct those questions to someone who would lead, lead that task force. And um, Dr. Donovan, I'm looking at you again as a coordinator on behalf of this faculty maybe to receive the questions yeah. uh, but if we could all think of various questions that we think are germane to what we're trying to accomplish and submit those and then collectively once they're all in we can circulate them among ourselves and determine what are the top 15 or 10 questions that we believe every candidate must address Yes. And Attorney Murray, if I may, uh, we have a bank of questions, probably of about 30 to maybe 40 questions that we've used in previous searches at this level. If that would be useful for this committee, we can share that with you as a starting point. Um, the questions that are broken into several categories that we expect a, a chief executive officer of a campus to be able to address uh, in their leadership. So I think we can give that to you all as a starting point and you can sort of massage it to reflect the law center more specifically. Um, time frame for, for to get the questions in. Uh, what's your thoughts on that? We know we need to is almost immediately. Okay, so we, we got the jump start there to get us going. So we want to say seven to ten days that if you have questions, direct those to Professor Diamond. And that way she will compile all the questions. And then um, if we can have a small committee on task force regarding this task to maybe narrow that down to report back to the body instead of everybody looking at you know 80 questions. Um, yes, that's Can I have some clarification please? I thought my task was to gather questions from the panel. Yes. Faculty? So this group. Just so that we can get I think the questions themselves, um, to me there are at least 10 or 15 questions that must be raised regarding experience, competence, mm -hmm. leadership, uh, those types of things probably would find themselves intertwined um, at this point. So, I mean, is there a different thinking here that there should be cool questions regarding another area? Well, so if we're going to ask general questions, and it'll be the same questions to all candidates. So we can't ask specific questions about. No, this will be for purposes of this body's interview of the semifinalists. What the faculty may raise during their meetings with the semifinalists, that's going to be controlled differently. What may happen, the question that will be submitted to you that you will raise to each one of the applicants would be different. We're talking about this body making sure that we cover the core elements of deanery when we're interviewing. Is that outside the scope of what you were willing to set by set? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what is this called? <laughs> Done. <laughs> uh, but let's help Professor Diamond, guys, if we could. I, I, I would love for you to have, I, I think you bring a different aspect than most of us around the table, your administration and your tenure. I think you bring a different element. Um, so I, I think the question is vetted by you with a small group. We will get what we need. Any volunteers to assist? Ms. Randall, Ms. Mustache, Ms. Harrington, and Ms. Love. That will make you need to make up a few minutes. Okay, again, we got all the names. Randall, Mustache, Harrington, and Love. And uh, any committee member that wants to submit questions for the semifinalists for the interview that we will conduct on February 23rd, try to get those in within the next uh, seven days. Is that adequate? In the next seven days. Uh, you have also on item eight timeline. 
you should have in the past uh, shown circulated to everyone uh, a proposed timeline that gets us through the March 18th uh, Board of Supervisors meeting. So in, uh, February 2nd will be our next meeting. What we need to discuss is what will actually take place on that date. I perceive that we will take the nine applicants and reduce that down to a favorable number of semi-finals. What we reported to the board on January 8th was four to six finals, semi-finals, okay? That number would be, I think, on February 2nd, we may look at that number and say it's four people, whatever it may be, but let's reserve if we could. Let's see how we get through the process of reviewing the paperwork in the due diligence report from everyone on each candidate, what you find out there, and that will aid us in being able to determine what is a real number out of this time that maybe we would want to come back and report. Yes. Are we going to divide up the work today? I was hoping that we would do that on the due diligence piece. Yeah. Yes. So we're good on that, guys. That will be our purpose on the twenty uh, on the February second. So now the last part is the assignment of due diligence tasks for the nine applicants. Um, we have. Will we vote, Mr. Murray? Will we vote for how many candidates? On the February the second meeting, do you think should advance the semifinals? Well, the president requested four to six, so he gave us a lot of latitude. A lot of latitude. I think at the end of the day, you know, on February second, we can look and see exactly what we have. We may find some things that our candidate does not possess automatically. They're probably disqualified if they didn't speak truthfully in their applications. We may find things of that nature that may disqualify people. The process itself may bring us down to a number. And we may say, okay, well, here we have this number. Now the, these candidates have the competence, experience, and leadership ability to take, take themselves to the next level. Mr. Murray, yes. will we vote that day or will we just. I, we I think we we'll reserve it for that day, yes. Okay. I think we we'll reserve it for that day. So that makes it an important meeting for all the yes. committee to be present. Yes. Collectively, are we okay with that? Uh, <laughs> So let's look at the list of candidates so we can make assignments. We have uh, nine applicants. There are a num there's numbers placed by each candidate based upon the timing of the submission of the application. So as you can see, Mr. Robinson was first and Mr. Castile was last in submitting applications. So that's all it is. That's the way we numbered them. That's for the nine alphabetical order or any other uh, ranking or ability or anything of that nature. Anyone willing to take on the due diligence task of reviewing the complete application of Mr. Robinson and then following up? Uh, and I think if we talk about this a little bit, uh, what we're thinking here is the opportunity for you to be able to say, okay, where does Jay Robinson work? I believe this is the gentleman that's a judge in the Texas courts. Uh, you know, call his colleagues, talk to them. He made an application with doing, you know, verification of some things. Talk to lawyers in the community. If we can find a lawyer that we know in the community, maybe a lawyer appearing before this judge, what type of judge is he? Uh, but the due diligence would have to be done on each candidate that would aid us in, in hopefully making a better decision. Is this person the right fit for Southern University? Is there a, 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 a number of questions that's universal to all the candidates? Let's let's talk about that. Probably we have some structure to it more than likely. Uh, so that's another thing that we need to probably vet out a little bit here today. Great question, but we also would have to come up with those questions as well, uh, and be able to complete that by February second uh, before we get back together. Um, the right? Excuse me, Chairman. Yes. I was just a little curious of with the, the this process and the mm -hmm. purpose of it at this point. The due diligence? Yeah. Well, what we want to do is make sure that as we receive someone, that the information that is provided in this application is true and accurate to the best of our ability. We just don't want to take it for face value. 
on its face with the presumption is that it is truthful. We just want to make sure that there are some things that we can verify. Um, just knowing those things about a candidate, I, the local people, we all know the local people, but there may be some other people that we don't we don't know anything about them. And uh, maybe the perspective of how they handle themselves as a lawyer or a judge or, you know, that may aid us in our process here. Well, I, I just have a, a concern that when you have different people talking about a surge, it leads to information not only getting out but misinterpreted or it may just cause more confusion than necessary, in my opinion, given the Southern University nature. And uh, I would probably advise that you just move forward with the candidates as, as they are. And when you get down to your last four, your last three, then you do your due diligence. Because some of them might fall out and may not be worth all the effort. That's just my thoughts. Because our lawyer, one of our lawyers, <coughs> has some you know, insight for us. And you know, being a lawyer, I'm gonna, I have to listen intently to the lawyer. Uh, so what's your thoughts? Do we want to leave due diligence when we get down to the semifinalists? And what we don't want to do it with nine, nine candidates. Okay. I'm going to agree with us, um, Attorney Woods on that. Um, once you go over your criteria, then all, you know, what we expect that candidate to have. And once we get it down there or down, I think it will give us a better um, time to do the um, you know, on the candidate. Professor Dunn. I'm just very interested in not using our resources on someone that that we could eliminate. We might eliminate, let's say, but I don't want someone to, to invite someone to come and then find out that there's something swirling in the application of the background. So I guess it's most it's most sensitive at the point at which we narrow at which we narrow to whatever. So sometime before we actually make an invite on campus, would you say? I don't think that'd be appropriate, but I don't know if it's necessary at this point because somebody may fall out and you know a person may have. So we have the point where we get to the semifinalists, the four, the six, or whatever that yeah, number I may think magically that, be. We decide, I think so. Too. Then we would set up the due diligence on those yeah. candidates. And I think whenever the due diligence is done, it should be the same throughout. You know, the same person should do it, the same person should ask the question, or we should hire a company to do background checks. Mr. Chairman, being an old lawyer that's been beaten up many times doing the right thing when I did it the wrong way, uh, I see the potential for us as essential agents of Southern University, being on the phone, having conversations with people in an improper manner from the viewpoint the person receiving the phone call. And there's one thing about being able to go to biographical dictionary, so to speak, the um, Westlaw, LexisNexis websites. We can have but if we get on the phone and start making some phone calls, it needs to be somebody trained in knowing the law, such as the Russell West, because they're waging word those inquiries that are not offensive, and sometimes we use the vernacular or else are a little vague in the way we ask it, and we might cause a problem that we didn't anticipate calling. So I would love to see the due diligence done either by a small group of people who are skilled or experienced at doing this than I had that. It's a great, we've got to bet everybody because the last thing we need is somebody showing up for an interview that obviously has got fraudulent credentials or otherwise, which is what you're trying to prevent. And I think that's a, that's a purpose we need to serve. How to do it, I think, is the discussion we're having. You have comments, you have thoughts. And so we know right now we don't need to make that decision today, but we need to think about this a little bit more. Uh, give us an opportunity to, to think through this. I'll get together with President Belcher a little bit more. We'll talk more about it. Uh, I definitely will get together with the lawyers uh, for their guidance and suggestions on how we take the next steps regarding due diligence. And if everybody's okay with that. Could, could we have them go through these resumes using objective neutral sources of information to verify these people that are 
that, that I, the ones that are local, I think we all know that they got a law degree here, they got it wherever. But some of these other folks that are out of state applicants, we probably could do a computer search on this. Haven't you done this before? Looking at the background? Yeah. Yes. And, and so I think we could do it unobtrusively, and it might be beneficial well, on the front end to have one person go take a look at these resumes, especially for out of state folks, so we know, because we don't know what they've done. I read every resume that was sent, and I, I know the activities of most of the folks that are Louisiana people involved in it. Um, and I think most of the folks here on this committee do. Some of these folks, if we're going to give fair consideration to them, like the judge from Dallas, I had no idea about that judge, and I don't know whether he's really a judge, but somebody can verify that, it seems, without being intrusive or even getting on the telephone, I, I would think. And that step might help us with some information that we need to help either qualify or eliminate, which is what I thought you were trying to do. Well, Professor Riddick, I think that's probably something I could do, but I would not want to eliminate the locals because if we should treat anybody. Oh, you do them all. You, you do, do them all. all. Yeah. Okay. But I, I'm not suggesting you should give favor treatment to the locals because we know them. But, you know, if they're, if, if they're not telling the truth in their resumes, I think somebody at this table or on the staff somewhere will know it. Now, they may be exaggerating a little bit about whether they were chairman of the committee or got it all done or whatever, but those aren't. Uh, those are fudge words, not uh, necessarily fraudulent. Okay, so what we'll do, uh, move the discussion, we're going to wrap our arms around this topic. We're going to try to either telephonically communicate with everyone, we're going to get together with the council, we'll see next steps regarding the due diligence, where we instituted, uh, and, and we're part of the process. Okay. All right, so let's move uh, to item number seven. Um, yes. yes. About. Um, the meeting with the Law Center faculty and students mm -hmm. on the 23rd. Yes. Since we do have, we, we may have local candidates who advance, uh, would it be easier and kind of relieve our schedule on Tuesday to, depending on how many local candidates are advancing, to split that between the 22nd and the 23rd? to give us some flexibility on our schedule for the 23rd because people who are in Louisiana, everybody who's a local candidate is in the city, right? So would it free up our schedule on on Tuesday to have some of that work done with the faculty and the students and the staff with locals on Monday? What's your thoughts, Ms. Gaines, Mr. Harrington? Did you see one meeting with the group or did you see two meetings? Today. Two days? Okay. That sounds like a great idea. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's structure it that way. I think when we invite semifinalists, we'll have to let them know that their arrival needs to be structured such that they would have an opportunity to be able to arrive back in rooms if it's checking in a hotel, being available for transportation to the law set up a particular time. So that's something for the details that we'll work out with the three of you all. Okay. And I guess it's a very important to travel the way. Are we good? Okay. Yeah, all minds clear, we're going to go to item number seven. And that's the session of the evaluation instrument. Um, if you look in the information that was circulated, Joe gave us each a sample candidate evaluation sheet. Um, this is something that was put together uh, from other search that the university has conducted. Also, what was taken into consideration was the position announcement and criteria associated with uh, deanery. And uh, this is what we came up with more consideration and probably advance the discussion. So if you would take a moment to look at it, uh, the, the, the rating scale is you know zero to five. And there are right now 13 uh, areas that will assist us in grading applications uh, that you would have uh, have received telephone uh, over the internet. Take a moment to look at this to see if there are additional things that you would think would be relevant, but we will need a evaluation tool uh, to be able to at least uh, rank these applications, rank these candidates, and it's something that we would definitely need for final consideration before we make the selection for the semifinalists. So when we meet on February 2nd, 
we will have to have in hand an evaluation tool that this committee believes is the one that we want to use. So suggestion, yes, Professor. Am I overlooking scholarship? No, what we're suggesting, this is just for us to look at today. Okay. Between now and February 2nd, we're going to okay. have to complete this. What we want to do is one, if you know, to add and just delete what we mm -hmm. think may be duplicative, okay. insert what we need. So for right now, if we can just look at it and see there are some areas such as scholarship that is omitted, then we need to add those things, but we will start circulating among the group what we believe ultimately be, would be the final evaluation to. And once we think we have something finalized, then we will then circulate it to okay. everyone so that when we convene again on February 2nd, everyone will have this tool to get us through uh, a review and discussion of the applicants via paper, via, uh, you know, well, at this point, we know we're not doing any of the due diligence at that point, but it would help us be able to narrow this down based upon who we believe should become semifinals. Yes, Professor. And so when we do this, we'll do it concomitantly or contemporaneously with their appearance or we'll do it in order to screen the paper initially? Well, I, I think we're doing it to get to the semifinalists. We're using this for the semifinalists and then for the final date that's recommended this week, we're going to have to, each one of us will have to vote again and uh, make a determination of who we believe what the semifinalists would be. So we're actually going to use it? Yes. Once. Twice. Yes. And then we'll turn it in and then We'll, we'll tally it up, we'll talk about it, we'll see what it looks like, and we have to What would be the process of looking back, like where we all just sit here and go through it, or do we need a... Well, we were hoping that, my, my thoughts is that everyone would take between now and the next meeting and truly review these documents, mark it up like you're a law clerk, get your red pen out, or a professor, I should say, be a professor on this. Get your red pen and everything you like with a smiley face by it. Check it. Everything you just like, need more, you know. Uh, not fully developed. I think that's the word I saw a lot of my papers. Develop is more. <laughs> uh, but whatever that might be, so that way if we speak to a particular candidate, if we speak to candidate number seven, that we will all know that we're talking about this person just because we're talking about the makeup of that candidate and what was submitted. And it would give us an opportunity, one, to be able to, at this point, to see how we all are thinking and be able to pull this a little bit closer together. Yeah. So we, we, we know that scholarship. Anything else is glaring, guys, that needs to be in here? And Ms. Merrick has taken the, uh, the lead on, you know, tweaking this document as we're moving it forward. Um, so we're going to be certainly any uh, any comments that you may have, please co uh, copy me on it, and that way I will work with Ms. Merritt so that we get the final document out to everyone. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, so when we are evaluating this, is this kind of like our due, due diligence in the sense that we have questions? And, okay. I forget what we end up deciding on that due diligence. Before. Well, for example, this is not for the due diligence piece. This is for your review of an application to determine how you would rank these nine at the end of the day. Okay. As we're going through this, there's something maybe I had a question on. Did anyone find anything on this? Or like, yeah, you can yeah. do that as well. Yeah. And that's a little note section at the bottom yeah. of the comments. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Under each and every area. Are we good? Okay, so hopefully within the next 10 days, you will have the final two so that when you come back on February 2nd, you will at least have had an opportunity to do what? Have reviewed everything, made your notes as to each applicant, have a, a tool on top of each applicant uh, paperwork, and then we will begin our deliberations on all the candidates so that collectively, you may have to hear in comments from Mr. James that you want to change your ranking on candidate eight to either a higher or lower number based upon his interpretation of the qualifications of that candidate. So I think the collective wisdom will help us then be able to pull together what we believe that the semifinalists should be. Okay. Any other questions regarding the evaluation tool and how we're going to move forward? Any yeah. other? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Yeah. 
just taken for granted what's the ramifications at this point? At, at this point, that's all we can. Hopefully, that they will report that I was successful and, you know, Paying a grant of X number of dollars for the legal clinical education department, or if it's not related to the law that I obtained a grant for some program in the community, you know, something of that nature. Mm -hmm. From what I can see here, we're down to item nine of the business. Any other business to come before the committee? Anything from legal? Nothing. We just had. Uh, we were talking about one suggestion, and that is if you conduct your interviews over two days, it would be best not to segregate all your local candidates on one day and all your visiting candidates on the other day, just for appearances sake. Just just mix them up. The candidates won't mind traveling. Okay. So, um, is it not public record who all applied Well, this is a public meeting. Uh, I don't think we have actually posted uh the nine names anywhere um if, yeah if there's a request i think at the earlier meeting we suggested that there was a particular quest request regarding our deliberation the questions be directed to me i can tell you the moment i walk in the law center every thursday i'm in and they with everyone that it's the law student yes. everyone yeah. that's why i get that early now <laughs> i'm arriving early yes is there a reason why you wouldn't uh, legal? Yeah, there, there are going to be things the committee receives, and I'm talking beyond the names of the applicants, in doing the evaluation that would not be public records. I mean, a, a letter, a resume is a public record, but you may come in contact with academic transcripts, um, work somebody did as a student, given we're talking about lawyers, possibly work somebody did for a client that they want to tell this committee that might not be public. So just because the committee's in possession of it isn't going to automatically make it a public record. It's my question was more specific. My question was, is there any reason why we shouldn't release the names? That, that's up to the committee. I see. I'll ask because I sent out an SBA announcement email and students have been asking. <laughs> they want to know who the candidates are. So I was wondering. They, they are who they are. I don't see I, I personally don't see any reason why we got to this in right. form of fashion. Yeah. Yeah. Usually, um, Professor Diamond, I'm sorry, thank you for that. I sent out a notice to uh, both the staff and the faculty after each meeting. So, uh, it would be good because I know they're going to ask us before we get the I mean, from what I'm hearing, it sounds like we would want at this point for the university uh, to uh, have authority to move forward, at least noticing the faculty at the South University Law Center for Mr. Harrington to feel free to provide whatever resources he has so that he communicates with the student body who the candidates are. Um, uh, legal, with respect to other identifying information, where would you? There, there's no problem with releasing the names. So okay. we have to the what, what I just wanted folks to understand is as they start to get the information they review, it's not public just because you have it. Okay. Yes. Would it be your desire for us to go ahead and make a formal press release? That may be yeah. good for the That's committee right. too. Uh, yeah. But you did say that um, as far as communication on Yes, yeah. I, and I'm going to call, as I told the counselor earlier today, uh, no potholes will happen. Mm -hmm. So he's going to be on my speed dial. Okay. Uh, if I get a call, I'm going to call him to give me a moment. I'm in the middle of something. I'll call the counsel. We're going to get together. And then I'll call whoever back that needs some information or whatever it is that they may be doing a search on to make sure that we are compliant. Well, I, 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 I do think that that's a good idea that you could press the result. And then they could, you know, go from there. It's consensus of the body that we do a press release. That's what I, that's what I think. 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 That's what I and we'll sit down and look at them, keep it out there and look at them. Some people post them online, as you know, but I don't think we necessarily need to do that because the people are going to be most interested in looking at them, whether we find them sad. So, now, we do plan to assemble a several free range binders for the faculty 
for the student body so that we have this available at the law center. So we will put that together. We will have it in a secure location where, you know. Well, if it's on reserve, then I you know, they're used to going into reserve and getting, getting documents. It may be a more secure place. Yeah, we can put it on reserve as well, That's what I was thinking. And then anybody, if you issue a press release, or Plus, the diamond sends out another one of our emails, which was very helpful and got a good response from everybody. I think it would be helpful for them to say, hey, I want to know about who's applying to it. But I didn't look at it. I don't see any harm to that at all. As long as it's not illegal. If you're talking about the, the CVs and their letters to the committee, yes. Those yeah. Are, okay. Well, look, I wasn't even going to include the committee letter, the letters of recommendation. I don't have any problem with that either. That's the CD. If it's legal. The CD was no problem with that. There's no problem with the CD. Well, let's compile that, uh, Ms. Mayor, if we could make that available to the uh, university and um, who will be thank you. So we will do that. But that'll be separate from what we want to compile for the faculty access, the student access, and staff access for that meeting that's coming up on the 23rd. Okay. Any other business to come before the committee? Is, is yes. this schedule the revised schedule? Um, it, it says draft, but I assume you're working off of it. The one that says draft schedule. Yeah, it has a timeline. Yes, we're looking at it. Let's make sure that these dates work for everyone, guys. But, you know, going forward from heavy lifting, we would like to have uh, everyone here. Uh, we're doing very good with our numbers to date, so um, I just want to make sure that it doesn't conflict with the schedule. The next meeting will be February 2nd. Very important meeting for us to be able to get to the point of determining who semi finalists will be. You know, February 23rd is an all day event for those, uh, particularly at the interview stage. Uh, we need you to be here by lunchtime on the 23rd. Uh, March 17th is a campus visit again for the uh, finalists that will be presented uh, to the president. Uh, so he'll be spending time with them. Yes. What? You said February 2nd? February 2nd. That's a Saturday. No, February 2nd is a Tuesday. February 2nd. Uh, That's my birthday. Right <laughs> 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 February 2nd is my birthday. You're adding a day on oh. February 26th. No, no, no. Sorry. <laughs> 23rd. 23rd. Basically, that's the date that the semifinalists will yes. be on campus. Yes. 23rd is going to be a long date. Right. And you're looking at the tentative interview schedule for those guys? And I think the committee members need to be here by lunch for sure, unless you want to participate in, you know, being at there for the breakfast and things of that nature. That'll be up to you. I know we're going to have faculty there. Uh, I will be there. I'm local. Some of us go. One or two certain designated time slots. Some of us go. I kind of follow all this. Tell me what I need to do. If you tell me that 12, then 12. Well, I know you have a drive. So 7.30 in the morning, I'll say tonight. Or we love <laughs> We're going to see you, Mr. Singleton, at breakfast at 7.30 on the 23rd. <laughs> uh, well, we miss you, Well, let me just uh, first and foremost uh, allow me to express my appreciation for your being here today. Uh, I want to commend you on the uh, discussion uh, and uh, the benefits that you're willing to uh, move forth with. I just wanted to have one comment with regard to these interviews. Because as I uh, gave reference to in, in my initial comments, I'm going to be leaning very heavily uh, on this committee uh, as to providing guidance and, and making the recommendation uh, uh, to the board. And of course, the board has its discretion whether or not they receive or accept uh, that recommendation. Uh, but uh, I'm, I guess I'm really pleased to know that uh, your diligence will uh, provide for me sufficient uh, inputs to, to, to uh, fulfill my obligation. Uh, having said that, and particularly in reference to the interviews, 
uh, what I heard you say was that you, you wanted to ensure that faculty and students uh, and staff were provided an atmosphere of uh, independence that would enable them to uh, uh, be forthcoming and engaging uh, with the candidates. But also, um, uh, so let me circle back because I want to also make sure that this committee have the benefit of observing how uh, the candidates respond to these constituent groups. Because I need to lean on you, not a open-ended letter from, from a faculty group or a student group or, or the constituents that may represent staff. So I would just ask your indulgence and sensitivity uh, once you begin those, those interviews such that I, I can benefit from, from your judgment alone. Understood. We're good. Any other business to come before the committee? Here we go. Okay. Just on February 23rd, we'll be in special sessions. So I'll be hanging out. Okay. Uh, it's thought. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, how, how tough is this? Should we keep the state or keep the state? We're probably just in the session. No, yeah, I'm not just the end of that. Okay. So, you okay with us keeping the date? Oh, yeah. Well, right. I, I won't have any leadership because I'll be able to leave. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. President, thank you for coming today for participating with us today and for your time and uh, participation with the committee. Uh, that's all we have to join at this time. Thank you very much. <laughs> 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 <laughs>